Please welcome Dr. Sidney Burris to the stage. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Today's lecture by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama is a dream years in the making. And for some of us, it's the dream of a lifetime. I would like to thank, to, to thank the members of the Distinguished Lectures Committee for sponsoring this event. We are deeply grateful for your support. Upon receiving news that the Dalai Lama would be able to visit us, we formed a steering committee last fall to begin making preparations. We hope to give everyone the chance to learn more about the events and the issues related to Tibet and the Dalai Lama. These preparations included a film and book series, as well as the events of Tibet Week, which began last Wednesday. One project we are highlighting is the Tutors for Tibetans program, a project that provides after-school tutors for exiled Tibetan children who live in refugee camps in South India. Since the 1960s, the Tibetan community has struggled to provide their children the traditional education they need to understand their distinguished heritage while preparing them to enter the modern world where they will ultimately make their way. Tibetan teachers in the south of India around Drepung Losling Monastery are currently working at full capacity in multi-age classrooms with only the most basic supplies. Tutors who work with the children both during and after school help reinforce the material covered in class while providing individual attention to the children who need it. Early reports indicate that our initial efforts have greatly improved the quality of education that the children are receiving, and the teachers tell us that they are deeply grateful for our help. Funding for more tutors and more supplies is desperately needed. If you are interested in assisting this program, please refer to the university's Dalai Lama website. My thanks to everyone who made these events possible this afternoon, including my co-chair on the steering committee, Melissa Banks, and all the other members on the committee for their hard work. It's been a tremendous year leading up to today's lecture from the 14th Dalai Lama. I would now like to invite the Chancellor of the University of Arkansas, G. David Gearhart, to begin the conferring of the honorary degree. Chancellor. Thank you, Dr. Burris. This is indeed an historic event. We are extremely honored by the Dalai Lama's visit to the University of Arkansas. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for our campus. Every year, His Holiness the Dalai Lama receives thousands of invitations to speak from all over the world. He can only satisfy a small number of those requests. We are most fortunate to be among those privileged few. The University of Arkansas strives to be a force of change regionally, nationally, and globally. We believe we have the power to improve people's lives and the obligation to do so. We promote the values of diversity, tolerance, understanding, and cooperation, and we actively forge international partnerships that reinforce and affirm those values. We are humbled by the opportunity to partner with the Dalai Lama in spreading his message of nonviolence. We had a marvelous conversation this morning with Vincent Harding and Sister Helen Prejean about nonviolence. And I am looking forward, as I know you are, to hearing His Holiness expand further on his ideas. Before we do, 
a few thanks are in order. First, I would also like to thank the Distinguished Lecture Committee for making this event possible. We also owe a huge debt of thanks to two faculty members. The first we just heard from, Dr. Sidney Burris, Director of the Honors Program in the J. William Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Burris has been responsible for heading the committee that planned the year-long series of events preceding this visit. He has done a spectacular job. The second faculty member is Geshe Dorje, a Tibetan, Tibetan monk and instructor in Fulbright College. Geshe is in fact a title designating a Tibetan Buddhist academic degree, meaning spiritual guide. Since it can take anywhere from 12 to 20 years to complete the rigorous curriculum needed to attain this title, there are necessarily very few Geshe's in the world. We are, in fact, quite privileged to have one teaching in Fulbright College. We may, in fact, be the only university in the nation with a full-time instructor who is a Geshe. Geshe Dorje and Dr. Burris Geshe Dorje and Dr. Burris met with the Dalai Lama during their most recent trip to India in summer 2009. They were visiting the Dalai Lama's compound with 15 students from the University of Arkansas as part of the TEXT project. This stands for Tibetans in Exile Today, and it is an oral history program designed to record the stories of Tibetans currently living in refugee settlements in India. The project focuses on the Tibetans who left their country in 1959, but still have vivid memories of traditional Tibetan culture. The Dalai Lama wanted to meet the faculty and the students who were working to preserve the history and life story of these peoples. This was not the first time they had asked the Dalai Lama to come to the University of Arkansas. As early as 2007, they had put in a request and then again in 2008. They asked again at their meeting in 2009. Finally, they received an email in March 2010 that began, and I quote, responding to your email of 2007, end quote. <laughs> they never forgot us. Needless to say, we were all elated. I cannot thank Dr. Burris and Geshe Dorje enough for their dedication to the Tibetan cause and their persistence in inviting His Holiness to visit our university. In August, working in conjunction with the Tibet Fund, the University of Arkansas will welcome its first Tibetan student, Yishi Shodan, to do graduate work in public administration. We hope this will begin a lasting relationship with the Tibet Fund and Tibetan students who seek an education here in the West and, our, and at our great university. The University of Arkansas is very fortunate to have been selected by the Tibet Fund to host such a student. I have no doubt that the involvement of Professor Burris and Geshe Dorje in the text project and tutors for Tibet played a part in bringing the University of Arkansas to the Tibet Fund's attention. Thank you again, gentlemen. Now let me say a few introductory words about today's honored guests. The Dalai Lama is the spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhists, and from the age of 15, he also served as political leader, a position he recently relinquished. He was forced to flee into exile after the suppression of a Tibetan uprising in 1959. He and his fellow exiles established the Tibetan administration in exile in India. The Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 for his nonviolent struggle for the people of Tibet. 
He became the first Nobel laureate to be formally recognized for his concern for environmental issues throughout the world. In addition to his role as spiritual and political leader of the Tibetans, the Dalai Lama is an international spokesperson for human rights and nonviolence and is among the most respected leaders in the world. In 2007, the Dalai Lama was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by the President of the United States. Since 1959, he has received more than 84 awards, medals, and honorary doctorates in recognition of his message of compassion, peace, nonviolence, interfaith understanding, and universal responsibility. He has also authored more than 70 books, which include An Open Heart, Ethics for the New Millennium, and the universe in a single atom. The president of the University of Arkansas system, Dr. B. Allen Sugg, the chairman of the University of Arkansas Board of Trustees, Dr. Carl Johnson, and the provost of the University of Arkansas, Dr. Sharon Gaber, will assist me in conferring the honorary degree. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. The University of Arkansas now has the great privilege of conferring an honorary degree to Tenzin Gyatso, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Honorary degrees are conferred upon individuals who have achieved extraordinary distinction in the sciences, law, the arts, a chosen profession, or public affairs. Recipients of the degrees are exceptional individuals who have demonstrated an appreciation of and dedication to the ideals and purposes of a university. It is my distinct pleasure and great honor to present His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his promotion of basic human values and secular ethics in the interest of human happiness, the fostering of interreligious harmony, and the welfare of the Tibetan people. It is a privilege for the University of Arkansas to bestow the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters to His Holiness. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, the Chairman of our Board, it is my privilege to present to you His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. His Holiness has been recommended and approved by the faculty of the university and by the board of trustees of our institution as a recipient of the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Dr. Johnson. Tenson Gyatso. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, for your distinction and exceptional accomplishments as a friend to all Arkansans. By the authority vested in me as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Arkansas, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Casa, and admit you to all rights and privileges pertaining thereto.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I will. Come here. Come here. Yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that Your Holiness address our audience. Thank you. Sometimes you just go like that, then it's sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> Uh, president. Oh. No. So, respected Chancellor and President, and other sort of city uh, professors, other teachers, and perhaps students, and then also some guests, uh, basically, we all. Uh, same human being, so I usually prefer use human dear brothers and sisters. Uh, <clears throat> Firstly, this is my first time come here, and I got the honorary degree from the University. Uh, I cannot pronounce properly the name. Doesn't matter. Uh, uh, Arkansas. Ah. Arkansas. Arkan. Arkansas. Arkansas. I don't know. Hmm? Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so really, great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, whenever. You see, people like you give me this kind of honorary degree. Uh, that gives me some kind of inspiration. Uh, a person now 76 years old, uh, I dedicate the well-being of other in different field. So this award, some kind of acknowledgement. So I appreciate. Thank you very much. Rest of my life, uh, I continuously dedicated. So I hope your award will not waste. <laughs> not <be> wasted. <laughs> uh, so then, I come from, I come from, uh, usually people call roof of the world, land of snow. Uh, then some people say, oh, that land, that country, rather sort of mysterious land. And even some book about Tibet, they call third eye. <laughs> <laughs> so Tibetan people have some kind of magical power like that. These are nonsense. Uh, and then me personally, some people uh, call me God King, uh, Living Buddha. That also nonsense. Uh, and then some people call me Demon. That also nonsense. <laughs> uh, what is a real person? I usually describe myself as a simple Buddhist monk. That is true. In my dream, I often remember I am a Buddhist monk. That is dearest in my heart. So then, uh, and I sort of received this kind of sort of degree, honorary degree, and also talk with the public. 
uh, even I'm not thinking as a Buddhist monk. I'm simply a human being. On that fundamental human level, we are same. Mentally, emotionally, physically, we are same. Then important, I want a happy life, you also want a happy life. Different sort of family background, different sort of level of education, wealth, rank, or different faith, different color. Uh, it's a secondary. What is important? We are human beings. Everyone wants a happy life. That is, from birth, we have the right to achieve happy life. So now question, uh, what is happiness? What is the uh, meaning of the happiness? I usually, of course, my own sort of the, the understanding about the different the English word, uh, I myself, not very clear, uh, but rough sort of understanding. So, the, I usually feel happiness means here deep satisfaction. So that means even pains, suffering, sometimes bring deep satisfaction. So here, main meaning, I feel satisfaction. So, then, what is the way to gain deeper satisfaction? Usually, the materialistic world, I think you consider some kind of satisfaction, mental level satisfaction, through sensorial experience, looking some beautiful thing, including spots, you get some satisfaction. And music, hearing, get some satisfaction. And taste, smell, touch, through these we get some satisfaction. So these kinds of satisfaction much depend on external factors. When these external factors absence, you feel boring. Other hand, like those I think serious sort of practitioners spend hermits hermit life, solitude but with deep satisfaction. No need to music, no need sort of some scenery. Simply think of satisfaction from that level, mental level itself, not relying on sensory level. That is really deeper level of satisfaction. So, I always see telling, sharing with people in order to be happy life. Uh, we should pay more attention about our inner value. Try to seek happy life from external, from money, from power. It's a mistake. Yes, money important. Uh, all these. Uh, no, I mean, no doubt, very important. But ultimate source of happiness is within ourselves. Here are no differences, whether educated or uneducated, rich or poor, or high sort of status or low sta low color status, no. status, or different color, or even believer or non-believer, no differences. That is to believer. Faith, tremendous faith to God, according to religion. 
that also immense source of inner peace, inner strength. Just this morning, as we witness to Christian practitioner, uh, according to their own experience, they made very clear how much strength comes from their faith. Uh, then non-believer, yes, now faith, not relevant. So then what else? I feel, of course, Buddhist and Jain, the follower of Jainism and some other ancient Indian tradition, the bronze, non-theistic sort of Religion. religions. However, uh, in each sort of tradition, the faith also takes an important role. But then, non-believer, uh, I feel, and also I think according to ancient Indian sort of tradition, the, I say the real source of satisfaction or inner strength is, I believe, human warm-heartedness. Of course, all religion strengthening that, but itself mainly from biological factor. When you're born, the way uh, we grown up, firstly, we're born from our mother. Even, you see, the, the child still mother's womb, the mother's mental state more calm, more happier sort of mood, state of, mind. state of mind, very positive impact on the unborn child. Mother's mental state at that time, too much worry, anxiety, anger, very bad effect for the unborn child. Then after birth, according to medical scientists, they, they say, after birth, the next few weeks, simply mother's physical touch is the crucial factor to properly develop their brain, their enlargement, enlarging their brain. Size. Size, size, size of the brain. Then obviously, those children who received adequate affection, or maximum affection at the young age. In deep insight, uh, they are more calm, more inner strength, less fear. I think here, outwardly, we all are quite smart, but uh, in deep insight, those individuals who received maximum affection, maximum care at a young age, I think these people, in deep insight, much more calm, less sense of insecurity. Then those children, those people who at that age lacking affection from our mother, or worst cases, abuse, right? abuse, then that, what say, what kind of scars, scars are there? Uh, leaves a scar. Oh, scars uh, remain several decades. Or oh, generally, I think up to that, whole life remain. So such people, such people, in deep insight, sense of insecurity, that automatically brings suspicion. That brings the sort of, sort of situation. You remain distance from the from other. As a result, uh, unsafe feeling and loneliness. Actually, such sort of things are against basic human nature. 
human nature, I think this morning also I mentioned social animal. So the, any social animal, there must be some emotion which bind, bind them together. Bind them together. That's a human affection. Not just a request or response to the request, but by nature, voluntarily, oh, they are human beings. Our brothers, our sisters, ready to help, and sort of sen sen so the sense of concern about their well-being. So that's not come through religion, not come through education, but by biological factor. So on that basis, using reasons using our intelligence to further strengthen that sort of sense of affection, sense of concern of others' well-being, can develop, this morning I mentioned, the, the biological factors of affection, it is biased, limited, very much mixed with attachment. The other one, with that, take as a seed, then through reasoning, through awareness, because of pros and cons, right? It. Oh, then you get conviction or altruistic attitude, compassion, loving kindness. It's immense benefit, not only other, but to yourself. With this conviction, then you can extend or promote further sort of level, that is unbiased compassion. That is genuine altruism. Uh, that kind of altruism can extend towards your enemy. Once you develop genuine sense of sort of concern or affection towards your enemy, Similar that towards your friend, and in some cases even stronger, because there is reason. People who are nice to you, they are doing some good things. So their consequences will be positive. The perpetrator, way, perpetrator, enemy, they doing, they carry some work harming other. So. Ultimately, they will suffer. They will face the consequences. Therefore, there is more reason to feel more concern about these wrongdoing people. Victim side. Uh, already, this is something now already happened. Uh, from Buddhist viewpoint, or those non theistic Buddhist viewpoint, they say one law of causality, chapter closed. But the perpetrator site now just start one new chapter. Uh, new chapter. So they have to face uh, negative consequences in long future. So there is a reason feel more concern about that. So in any way, uh, that is real sort of unbiased compassion. The religious people also, one my Muslim friend, he told me, true Islam practitioner should extend love and compassion towards entire Allah's creature. Wonderful. And then one my Jewish sort of friend, one time he mentioned, he advised some of his teacher. It, he advised some of his students in the class, he mentioned, when you ever face some people who usually you get irritate, irritation, uh, then think that moment, that person, image of God. So later, the student uh, reported him, oh, after we listen your sort of advice, that's in Jerusalem, uh, some Palestinian student in his class. Later, he told him, 
after we learned, you see, your advice, when we face some sort of check post, usually they get some irritation, some anger. So after that sort of sort of method and knows, then uh, think they, that person also image of God. So that much reduce immense help to reduce fear or irritation. So all religious tradition, that kind of sort of sort of technique there. So in any way, to non-believer, they firstly our common experience. That means we all come from our mother. Sometimes I jokingly you see telling or sharing with the audience. Uh, my mother, illiterate, uneducated, just a farmer, but very, very kind. So she, uh, of course, to all her children, very, very kind, especially when I was there, I'm the youngest. So she's really showing me uh, tremendous sort of kindness or love. So then I a little bit... Uh, showing bossy attitude was my mother. <laughs> I think her kindness spoiled me. So, as the, the villager, the child usually carry by mother and the ha hand on, on shoulder. shoulder. Uh, so, I carry by my mother. And then, I hold my mother's two ear uh, when I want to go this side. <laughs> do that at this side. <laughs> if mother uh, uh, not listen, uh, not follow my sort of instruction, then I shout. <laughs> so that's the indication. I think my mother so dear to me, very very kind. So therefore, I always telling people, I have certain amount of compassion. Of course, later, Buddhist training also immense help. But the original seed comes from mother. So that is, we all have the same experience, same potential. When we are young, as soon as we're born, we received immense affection from our mother. That experience reach deep. every particle of our blood. So, according to scientists, people who are surrounded by affectionate people, much happier. Even hospitals, much happier. They are recover much quicker. And then also the scientists say, constant fear, anger, hatred, actually eating our immune system. Warm-heartedness brings in a sort of, a sort of strength. A strength. So therefore, this body, this particle of this body, go very well with affection, with compassion. Not go well with fear and anxiety and anger. So therefore, as I mentioned this morning, I consider human being basically more gentle nature. So now, the topic uh, non-violence. Non-violence. In new century. In, in new century. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, as I mentioned this morning, 20th century, I think the most sort of extraordinary century of human history. During that century, a lot of innovation, innovations. innovations in the field of science and technology, and also different ideas, different systems. Uh, but meantime, that century uh, really become a century of bloodshed. If, if these immense Violence really solve problem of the world and brought 
really peaceful, happy world, then there could be some justification. But that's not. Even some sort of unhealthy sort of crisis or local sort of locally some sort of uh, bloodshed beginning of this century. These, I think, most of these the symptom of something wrong in the past, uh, something negligence in the past century. So therefore, now if we use common sense, we can develop conviction. Using violence is not at all right method or realistic method. The realistic method through talk. This morning, the lady is mentioned, that Christian Larry, man, sister, or a sister is mentioned. That's very true. Disagreement. Still, we are part of humanity. We have to live on this planet. That person belongs to other continent. But still, uh, you need this continent, people on this continent. So I often tell people, now today, we must develop concept of big we. The century old concept of we, small we and they and demarcation, solid demarcation and separate according to that reality and that concept of war, destroy of your neighbor, so called enemy, that's the victory of yourself. Now today, destroy of your neighbor, dis destroy yourself. That's the reality. America need oil. Uh, some extent, oil come from other part of the world. And the raw material also come from other part of the world. And also you need market. Uh, without other country, uh, uh, your sort of economy booming yeah. or yeah. economic development is, cannot take place. So that is today's reality. Then ecology problem. America, most powerful nation, you can't solve the ecology problem unless whole world work together making same effort, same goal. Otherwise, you can't solve. That's the today's reality. So now the concept of separate we and they is gone. Now we must consider an entire world as a part of we. There's sufficient reason from religious viewpoint creation of God, same God. Uh, and the, the, practically or realistically speaking, the nearly now seven billion human being is a heavily interdependent. That's today's reality. So therefore, now, with that kind of understanding, war, constant war, is outdated. Now, only thing is through dialogue. Whenever we face some problem, we have to solve that problem through dialogue. Listen their view and share our own problem. And then sh think more about common problem than how to solve jointly. That's the only way. Uh, so I usually should describe this century should be century of dialogue. When people, you see, uh, sort of almost now you see the new slogan, peace, world peace, world peace. Just that word, that word will not bring peace. Or through prayer also will not bring peace. peace. And the meditation, uh, through meditation, bring world peace. No. World peace, firstly, War, human action, human creation. So peace also, we human beings themselves must create. Through our action, peace will come. Peace does not mean no longer any sort of disagreement, no longer any problem. Problem remain there. If I jokingly, sometimes I jokingly telling people, if we really want peaceful world, no longer any problem. And either human species disappear 
or our brain change. <laughs> so, uh, that's not good. <laughs> In any way, you can't do that. I think human, human brain, one way, real troublemaker, but one way, human intelligence, uh, because of human intelligence, we human being, only human being, can develop infinite love, infinite altruism. No other animal. Biologically difficult, but as a seed of the compassion from biological factor, then use human intelligence. Through that way, we can develop infinite love and compassion. So I think, in spite of some trouble, worthwhile to survive. <laughs> so therefore, therefore, the problem there, we have to find effective, realistic method, that of dialogue. So, in our education system, I think uh, more sort of, sort of the, uh, presentation. Uh, more presentation about spirit of dialogue. And also, the dialogue also is very much related with inner strength, self-confidence. Fear, hatred, keep here. Dialogue, meaningful dialogue, difficult. Dialogue does not mean out of fear, out of anger, no. Uh, dialogue means sincerity, truthful, honest, respect others' right, others' interest, and willing to share their problem. Right. That's the basis of dialogue. So, in, in order to carry meaningful dialogue, you need sense of brotherhood, sisterhood. And here, very much involve the warm-heartedness. So, warm-heartedness, I think various education institutions, uh, I think should pay more attention about warm-heartedness. Uh, not those two believers, very good, through their own teaching, increase these things. And then, in general, the secular sort of education system, without touching religion, secular way, we can educate, we can promote these inner value. I must make clear, when I use the secularism, it does not mean negative attitude towards religion or disrespect towards religion, no. Secularism, according to Indian uh, understanding, secularism is respect all religion, no preference, this religion or that religion, and according to Indian sort of secularism sort of idea, even respect non-believer. Thousand years, in, uh, more than 2,000 years, there are certain school of thought, which is the nihilistic sort of school, view, school of thought. Uh, that school of thought criticized by the rest of the uh, Sort of, traditions. Uh, traditions, but respect people who are holding that sort of view. They refer these people also Rishi. Rishi means sage. So, uh, I think this morning I mentioned actor action. The viewpoint of the nihilism, uh, nihilist viewpoint, criticize. But person who have that view, respect. So again, make distinction, actor and action. Viewer, view, like that. So therefore, the, that's the way to bring this century more peaceful, uh, uh, no longer sort of mobilized murder. That's a war. Different view, different word. Sometimes through war, some individual become hero, but actually a murderer. Killing one person, uh, call murderer. Killing thousands, thousands, hundred thousand people killed, we call hero. Unfair. So we must uh, make effort, you see, to bring genuine, peaceful world. Whenever we find some conflict, 
we must utilize human intelligence, yeah, human warm-heartedness, combine these two through dialogue, solving the problem. So that's about my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Now some questions. Some questions. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Um, no question? Where? These, oh. Your Holiness, these yes. were the questions submitted through uh, internet, online. <clears throat> well, What? <laughs> What do you like most about going around the world? Kasha. What do you like most huh? about going around the world? Tamni kasa kal pekor wata dinam tu nye shuru chikar yonasa. That is a difficult question. Kal sasa kwa ya kutu se. Marichita tamni kasa kal pekor wata tu nye shuru chikar yon kutu se. I think worstly, I have no question. Freedom. Which you are enjoying. That's wonderful. And also, I like American style. Not much formality. That I love. Better. And some European countries, when I, when we met, <laughs> and also some Japanese, Japanese, whatever we are, something, they just nothing. <laughs> What is the real answer? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, to me, the more sort of, because of the occasion, meeting, even those Japanese, uh, usually very sort of reserved. Conserved, reserved. 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 Now become very, very close sort of friend of mine. So they also now loves complete informal, uh, <laughs> like that. So I like informal. Well, I like. Um, in what ways do our enemies oh, think, become our... I think it's a little story, uh, <laughs> perhaps, I think. When I was in Tibet, I think Life magazine uh, shows one picture of uh, Queen of England. Queen, actually on a ship, Queen makes speech. Very dignified way. Oh. In the meantime, wind, the queens has developed. Developed to load. Yeah, have a protective shirt. Love that. A so. skirt was being blown away by the, blown up by the wind. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, queen still low. Uh, so, the attitude is uh, un so the nothing happened. <laughs> If I am there, I first I go to <laughs> there. <laughs> Of course, I have deep respect or admiration about Queen England. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful lady. <laughs> oh. In what ways do our enemies become our most valuable teachers? Oh. Conditions. That I think this morning I already mentioned. Mm. <laughs> Isn't it? So, I think the So the, in a few words, we need uh, promotion of unbiased compassion. That means genuine compassionate attitude towards your enemy. Now, as a foundation for that practice, we need forgiveness, tolerance. So practice of tolerance and forgiveness, uh, only our enemy create that opportunity. Oh, there's one story. Uh, in Tibet, 
there's a whole, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a walkway around the temple. Mm. One person go there, and one person already there, and sit, and looks, meditate. Uh, and then the person who walking asked him, what you are doing here? He mentioned, I meditate on patience or tolerance. Then that person, then he said to him, in that case, go to hell. Uh, <laughs> then the person who supposed to meditate on patience immediately respond, <laughs> you go to hell. <laughs> When the person, without disturbances, you see, seems quite successfully sort of meditate on patience, but real sort of opportunity to come that, that no longer practice. So therefore, people who create a problem, that's a real teacher of practice of patience. That's, again, this morning I mentioned that, that does not mean uh, you bow down. Again, as I mentioned this morning and here also, Make a distinction, actor and action. Actor is concerned, being, human being, must respect, must show our love. But their wrong doing, their wrong action, in case uh, we have to take countermeasure in order to stop that. That also not out of anger, not out of hatred, but out of sense of concern of their well-being. As I mentioned earlier, like that. Next question. Um, what do you think of the Arab Spring, the, right. the ongoing democratic movements in Arab, uh, Arab oh, oh. Middle East? I think uh, it's a sign of desperation of the people. People. I think it seems that there are uh, many of them jobless or not satisfied, and on top of that, a lot of sort of suppression. Oh, recently, after that crisis uh, in India, I met one of my long-time friend, German diplomat, who served many years in Delhi, and recently, a uh, few, year, few years, he uh, posted in Egypt. So out of my own curiosity, curiosity, I asked him, what's the situation during the old regime? And he mentioned, oh, they, uh, some people, when you see, express some sort of different opinion, then arrest and torture. Very serious. Uh, when when I heard his sort of uh, explanation out of his own sort of witness, uh, things are really uh, difficult. So the situation happened out of desperate. So it is right. I always say, uh, uh, I always say mentioning or expressing, world belongs to humanity, not government. For example, oh. so like uh, Egypt belongs to Egyptian people, not few leaders, not kings, not religious leader, but the people. So therefore, the govern by the people, the best system is democratic, through election. And every uh, four years, five years election, that's the best way uh, to govern your own country by the people, for the people, and independent judiciary. And then uh, free press. I usually use it uh, sharing with Whenever I met, you see, or see, the media people, the people should have long nose like elephant nose, <laughs> and then should smell in front 
uh, front of me, front of uh, Chancellor or uh, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor, and you, and also very important to feel, to smell behind what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very important. Uh, sometimes you see some sort of strange people, outwardly very nice, but behind not that much nice. <laughs> so people must know that. They, so the media people should investigate what is going on, what is happening, whether the politician, whether the businessman, whether the scientist, whether the sort of educationist. <laughs> <laughs> or whether spiritual uh, uh, leaders like myself, you say you should investigate what the reality, then inform to public clearly, provided must be uh, unbiased, truthful, honest, objectively. That's also very important in order to build healthy society in every field, I think all those wrong things must inform public. Then these individual people may take more kind of the cautious way. Otherwise, like China, uh, in previous time, uh, yes, very tight control. And also, I think at that time, I think every people, uh, I think the majority of the people really full of enthusiasm, but that time gone. And then economy liberalization, a lot of opportunity making money. Then immense corruptions. No proper law, no other the free media. So in democratic society, the media people also have very, very important role. And then also this morning, uh, the sister is mentioned. The people get some kind of fear, eh? some kind of little negative sort of things. That also, you see, media people have the sort of responsibility to inform people more balanced way, more holistic way. Then there is plenty of reason feel optimism. Now I'm uh, over the seventy. Uh, 75 years, now nearly, now 76 years. Uh, I, one I learned in my lifetime, truthful, honest, transparent. Uh, firstly, I think truthful, honest, this real sort of strength. Gun, force, for temporary, decisive, but long run, very weak. Uh, truthful, more compassionate, truthful, honest, really there is sort of, because of the strength. With honest, truthful, you can conduct transparently. That brings trust from, uh, from other. That also creates more sort of, sort of strength. So that's the way. So therefore, uh, uh, media people should sort of make presentation the negative side, uh, destructive side. Uh, uh, meantime, inform people there is a basis of hope, basis of optimism. So that is my sort of little small suggestion like that. Um, this is a personal question. Um, did your holiness ever learn how to drive a car? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and when I was in Hasa, I think my age, maybe 18, 17, 18, uh, there are three old cars which belongs to Thajin Dalai Lama. Uh, then, the last, I think, at least, I think, two decades, just as a gap there. 
then I uh, sort of the bring uh, and also you see driver I call from India and then repair some of them and then while driver not there and then I start <laughs> uh, and still a little bit of sort of the formality so I cannot go outside the yellow wall no. within the yellow wall then there is no sort of distance or no long it's distance no space. Uh, no not space. much space but a garden so a lot of trees then I uh, drive <laughs> uh, one day the one occasion I drive then one branch or tree here like that so I close my eye then <laughs> bang <laughs> <laughs> So then, uh, I much sort of worry. Now, how to tell my driver uh, next day? <laughs> I a little bit nervous. Then I thought, thought the glass in the front was light. One glass broke. That glass, not ordinary glass, is just some drift to jig, It was a specially, it, had, it was a special type of glass that has jacket lines. Then, impossible to buy that kind of thing. Of course, at that time, no car in Lhasa market. Uh, and I thought, I think since my childhood, I have some kind of, sort of scientific sort of that mind rare or sort of experiment. So I thought, uh, sort of made ordinary because of glass. glass. Then, sugar melted and made very thick then one sort of sensor they watch like it drops oh one drops is so put on the glass oh then afterward looks similar <laughs> <laughs> that other glass <laughs> so i put that quietly and close well keep keep quiet <laughs> whether later the driver uh, notice that or not i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so that's my experience like that oh. um, how do you feel that your absence from Tibet has affected the young Tibetans and if you return how do you think it would change that oh there's Tibetan saying lame chenlo jangne chesere there's a Tibetan expression which says that the blessings of a Lama is a better from a distance. <laughs> of course, you see, Tibetan people inside Tibet are very, very eager. That's my return. And they want, before they die, they want to see me. I, I sort of receive a lot of sort of moving messages from Tibet. Uh, and then meantime, those more sort of, because of the intelligent people, they express to me, they send message to me, it is sufficient for them, the Dalai Lama, alive, freely. So, they appreciate my presence in free world. They feel then Dalai Lama can represent of them. Uh, but so far, Tibetan spirituality or Tibetan spirit, of course Dalai Lama institution also important, but important is the spirituality or tradition itself. Now, uh, more than thousand years that they actually uh, Nalanda tradition, I usually describe. Tibetan Buddhism is directly come from Nalanda institution. I think beginning of this century, and then last I think few centuries. Beginning of the I did this millennium. Millennium. Oh. Beginning of this new, uh, last millennium. Hmm? Uh, 
uh, it remained, I think, several centuries the so, so the best source of Buddhist uh, philosophical education. It's almost like academic. Not only is it mention how to pray, not that, just you see, explaining what's the reality and through investigation. So I usually, I found in the Narendra tradition, the science also there, science of matters, science of mind, both on there. Nothing to do with religion, just describe the reality. Then, on the reality, like momentarily changing on, on a subtle level, external matters as well as internal mind, always changing, always moving. So, on that reality, the concept of impermanence develop. And also, the way of existence are due to other factors. So, on that reality, the concept of absence of independent existence. Now, these are Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist concept. So, these also academic sort of subject, not religion. Then, third part, religion, Buddhist religion, how to pray, how to meditate, these things. Uh, so, therefore, I felt the Nalanda tradition is not only just uh, spiritual or religious tradition, but it is truly academic tradition. So, uh, in Tibetan tradition, Buddhist tradition, directly come from that tradition, because the real person, the main person who introduced Buddhism in Tibet was one of the top master or scholar of Nalanda institution, and also great logician. So therefore, in our tradition, logic takes a very important role. Other cases, like a Chinese Buddhist, not sort of Buddhist logic. Uh, not much role. Uh, not, not much role. So like that. So therefore, uh, a Tibetan tradition, Tibetan spirit, very much related with Buddhist sort of concept, Buddhist philosophy, is deeply rooted in Tibet, thousand years. So that's a Tibetan spirit, not relying on one person or one institution, like that. So I have no worry. Of course, when time comes, the possibility, when the time of our return comes, of course I can serve uh, uh, some extent. I can serve. But whether I am there or not, Tibetan spirit will remain. That's quite sure. Now, last 60 years, 50, 60 years, the new generations come, old generations gone. But the pattern spirit, as strong as before, sometimes even stronger. Like that. Um, Tibet is the headwaters. Ah. Tibet is the source for three major Asian rivers, Yang, Yangtze, Mekong, and Salween. Yes. China is damming, making dams to divert water into China. Mm -hmm. The question is, where do the affected downstream countries like Burma, mm -hmm. Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam yes. stand in push, um, pushing back or aiding Tibet? If fear of repercussions from Chinese authorities keeps countries from speaking out, how will the reactions build as Chinese control increases due to the need for water? What non-violent actions can be taken now and by whom? Hmm? As this is very, very important. 
One of my commitment is ecology. Uh, according to some uh, Chinese ecologists, they uh, describe Tibetan plateau as third pole because effect on global warming uh, from Tibetan plateau is as much as North Pole and South Pole. So he described Tibetan plateau as third pole. Uh, and then Tibetan plateau, that third pole, the rather also the delicate, because again, it is some scientists say, the rate of global warming, global level, rate warming rate. A, a rate of warming. Rate of warming, global level, 0 0.1. Tibetan plateau, 0 0.3. Because of high altitude and dry climate, so more serious. Uh, then, during my lifetime, and uh, particularly after '59, the the river, uh, these ri major rivers, because um, the river flow has really gone down. Uh -huh. Some cases uh, during, say. Uh, spring, or some cases, certainly you see increase because of melting uh, glaciers like that. So, in any way, these, as you mentioned, these major rivers, which I believe, I think, over billion human beings' life depend on this water. So it is, and obviously, whole northern India, these water come from Tibet. Is there? source of sort of the livelihood. Uh, livelihood. So therefore, it is a serious matter uh, to take care about this uh, ecology in Tibet and these waters, these waters, these rivers, and also very important to not pollute it. See, some cases, you see the nearby river, some factories and mining, that polluted water, uh, some valleys, some sort of in, in presidents where in uh, un unprecedented. Un unprecedented. Uh, unprecedented unprecedented sort of illness, and in some cases wild animal number of wild animals died because of the pollution of the water. So it is very very serious. So now I think the one practical thing is. Uh, I always see uh, suggesting some uh, parliament and group or some sort of government sort of officials and some individuals who have the interest about the ecology, then go to Tibet uh, with full cooperation of Chinese ecologists, because this is interest for everyone, not a political matter. So go to go to Tibet and on the spot thorough sort of investigation how much damage already done and what is now the method uh, to recover this damage and then most important how to take special sort of precautions uh, not damaging or say the ecology so chinese also need using these kind of sort of suggestions with full cooperation with Chinese specialists, I, I think that you can do. I think you can do. Uh, although some of these local Chinese sort of officials very narrow-minded, uh, so sometimes they put unnecessary restrictions. But okay, uh, uh, it is important to try, as I feel. Then uh, after sort of thorough research, uh, then I think can make some suggestions to concerned country, particularly the Chinese government. Like that. That's my view. Um, what are your future plans after stepping down from the role as the political leader for Tibet? Nothing, nothing new. Of course, the, 
the responsibility about the political sort of rule now handed over or to elected political leadership. Actually, last 10 years, is my position is semi-retired position because uh, 2001, we already achieved elected political leadership. So, uh, since then, my position is semi-retired position, some, something like figurehead. Now, uh, I retired uh, all the uh, sort of uh, form of formalities, uh, formal responsibility. Uh, formal responsibility. So that uh, I have more time uh, for my two commitment. That is uh, number one commitment, promotion of human value. And the second commitment, promotion of religious harmony. Now, rest of my life, of course, well, since many years, I always did telling uh, three responsibility, three commitment. Number one commitment, promotion of human value. Second, promotion of religious harmony. These two, uh, my lifelong commitment. Then third commitment is about Tibetan sort of uh, struggle uh, and political rule. Now, that commitment, I always make clear there's a limitation. Now, time come, and I really feel uh, proud. I end this four century old tradition. Dalai Lama institution is the head of both temporal or political and spiritual. Uh, one reason, I always say telling people, the religious institution and the political institution should be separate. So while I'm telling other people, I myself hold both. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, the hypocritic sort of expression. So now I made very cl clean, clear. Now I'm simply spiritual leader, one of the spiritual leaders the all political handed over. So that I took voluntarily, happily, and proudly. And another thing, I think selfish reason, uh, the four, almost four century old tradition voluntarily and is much better than uh, if sort of some, due to some pressure, that end is not nice. So I, I also is suggesting, since it's a few years, I also suggesting to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, now should think gradually retirement. Chinese Communist Party, <laughs> retirement. Oh. You see, with retirement with grace. It's much, much better. Like Egypt or these things, you see, they, some kind of retirement from desperate, that's not good. Disgrace, isn't it? So, now I already sort of demonstrated in the eyes of those Chinese Communist sort of Party, I voluntarily now retired. <laughs> I think we, small community, exile community, about 150,000 Tibetan, we fully sort of engage democratic practice. I think as far as democratic practice is concerned, we small community much, much advanced like that. So I think eventually the Chinese government also can learn from our experience. <laughs> so in any way, the people's problem of China, most of the populated nation and Chinese people 5,000 year old culture or history, civilization. And generally, Chinese people are cultured people uh, and hardworking and realistic. So look, wherever Chinese community, one group or bigger number of Chinese sort of uh, community there, they create Chinatown. 
Chinese law, character survey. Letter. Letter. Because you get and Chinese Chinese la- uh, uh, characters. Okay, Chinese character and Chinese food, or oh, everywhere. It shows they adopted, adopted way, Letter. adopted the local sort of with local people, and productive. Meantime, kept their culture. Oh, really wonderful. So I often telling my Indian friend, why not where Indian community there, Indian town. Uh, naturally, it's the same. Where Indian com- bigger Indian community, you see, they also you see have some temples like that. So they carry some pujas, a puja or worships these things. But they didn't create the name India Town. So Chinatown there, India Town, must be. <laughs> and in fact, uh, in, uh, even in the Kasa, Kasa, the main Kasa, the Mayo Clinic. Oh, Mayo Clinic. Uh, some Indian physicians there. So among the professions, the number of Indians like that. So therefore, uh, so in any way, you see, the Chinese people are really realistic, hardworking, practical people. Uh, now, economy also is growing uh, well, although the gap rich and poor, that's quite terrible, and corruption, immense corruption, that's very sad. Otherwise, it's quite a healthy sort of way uh, growing. Uh, so therefore, eventually, I, I always tell my Chinese friend, it is deserved that uh, 1.3 billion human population, that big, that because of the most populated nation, deserve to become superpower. But in order to become superpower, respect, trust from the rest of the world is very essential. Without that, just military power brings more fear, more distrust. So therefore, in order to bring trust, respect from the rest of the world, China should carry transparency. That's very important. Uh, Close society, too much censorship. And the censorship, regarding censorship, I often is telling my Chinese friend, 1.3 1.3 billion Chinese people have every right to know the reality. And also, 1.3 billion Chinese people also have the ability to judge what is right, what is wrong. With that sort of circumstances, censorship and distorted information is immoral, fooling their own people. So therefore, I think China bring democracy immediately. That I have some reservation. Uh, if the central authority collapse, then there could be chaotic situation. There is nobody's interest. Gradual change, as I mentioned earlier. Gradually, the Communist Party now, or oh, I think Chinese Communist Party, at a young age, genuine socialist communist. Now, old age Chinese communist, now capitalist communist. <laughs> <laughs> now, perhaps next stage, gracefully retired. <laughs> so, in any way, I think the practice or introduce transparent free information, eventually independent judiciary, that I think must start. That's my feeling, my view. Of course, that's in the, in the eyes of some of the, these Chinese hardliners, I, that's the real demon, uh, demon sort of view. <laughs> they describe me as a demon, right? Demon. demon. Uh, so when I heard that <coughs> first time, <coughs> I immediately acted, oh, oh, I have this horn, demon horn. (laughs) These are, I think, very, very childish 
Uh, silly. No. Uh, that's what I said. Your Holiness, <coughs> how can one live peacefully, at peace, when he has so many responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, such as work, family, and so on? Mm. Yes, if uh, someone really uh, feels peace uh, means no problem, then that kind of peace is impossible to achieve. <laughs> I think the only answer for that should end your life. <laughs> then no problem. <laughs> that also silly. <laughs> So while we are alive, live surrounded by some kind of problems. That's quite nature. Uh, so it is wise to find inner peace, inner strength. Then no matter what surrounding, that can be possible. I think, of course, I'm a monk. Celebrate, no problem about family or children or these things. <laughs> but equally, I have a lot of problems. But uh, when problems start, when problems face, some disturbance in my mind, but then gone. Then on, the, on the surface, usually I describe like ocean. On the surface, wave comes and goes, comes and goes. But underneath, always calm. That we can do with help of intelligence. Uh, and, uh, what's it, uh, inner strength. These two combine. You can maintain inner peace, no matter what surrounding. And after all, the 8th century is one Buddhist master, Buddhist philosopher, expressed, how do love that? Uh, his advice was that when dealing with problem, uh, if you um, see that there is a solution to it, then there is no need to be overwhelmed. But if there is no solution to the problem, then there is no point in being overwhelmed. <laughs> That's a very practical suggestion. Isn't it? Very, very practical and realistic sort of approach. That we can do if we use human intelligence properly, and more because of the holistic view. And then we can maintain inner peace, no matter what sort of problems surrounding you. Um, <clears throat> please give me your thoughts on how to raise a spiritual child in the 21st century. I think generally, uh, I usually, you see, uh, sort of keep the idea or view uh, three way of, three kinds of spirituality. One spirituality, uh, with concept of God, like Judo Christian tradition, Islam tradition, and some others. Uh, then another spirituality, uh, the, uh, like Buddhism and Jainism, as I mentioned earlier, in some ancient other Indian tradition, they, they believe law of causality cause and effect. That means action, effect, action, effect, action, effect. Uh, that also one way to develop spirituality. Then there must be a third. Without talking, without touching religious faith, simply use our common sense and common experience on, on, the ba on based on these things, use our intelligence. Then, nature's sort of warmth given by our parent, particularly our mother, combine these two things, human intelligence, human 
warm-heartedness. That also I call secular ethics, secular spiritual. So, that's my view. So, according to your own experience and also judging the mental disposition of your children, uh, make available the information, all these things, then let them eventually choose. Without spirituality, without moral principle, no matter what sort of great profession, uh, it may not be sort of successful. That's quite clear. So, that, so that's my view. Uh, two final questions. Okay. Um, is it is it thought or action that is most effective when it comes to forgiveness, compassion, and happiness? I think firstly motivation. Then motivation brings action. Different motivation. Apparently, same action is hypocrisy, not genuine. So every human action, uh, more effective action, some neutral action, you see, eating here, my hand go there, is Neutral action. A yeah. neutral action. But more serious action, there must be motivation. So ultimately, all the positive action uh, based on sincere, positive, altruistic motivation. Then motivation alone, just to remain motivation alone, also not sort of effect, so action. I think both important. important no. uh -huh. um, if you think you will be able to return to Tibet, how long do you think it will take? Karsa. Pearlia, Lotur is Gongu Yenas. This is Kazu's Gogu Retul Gongu's. That I don't know. <laughs> it may take five years, ten years, fifteen years. But it, one thing quite, quite clear people's work with China, even the Communist Party, within the party, uh, they are sort of different opinions now coming and changing, changing. So in any way, I think in the, in the 20th century, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1916-17, uh, uh, then, then within the century, it changed. Not by external force, but within the people, within the country, through peaceful means. So many dictators, like I think Philippine dictator, Marcos, you see, changed by popular movement, peaceful movement. Like that, you see, many parts of the world, it happened. So things will change. And then Cuba, your neighbor here, Cuba, uh, still Castro, the old sort of the, also the revolutionary, uh, still there. I think his brother, younger brother, basically, I think same, I think ideology, but more now according new reality. Now they also start changing. So after all. As I mentioned earlier, the best way to govern the country by people is democratic system. There's no question. So eventually, I think China also is have to follow that tradition, that sort of practice. Right. There's no other choice. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.
Thank you, Your Holiness. Audrey. I know that I speak for everyone here, Your Holiness, when I say that we are deeply grateful that you have taken the time to speak with us today. Your message is of immense benefit to us. Thank you, Jim Palau. Before we go, I would like to present the financial accounting for today's events. $100,000 was donated from the Distinguished Lecturers Committee, and approximately $170,000 was generated through ticket sales. All monies have been used to finance the production of the morning panel discussion and the afternoon lecture. Included with the production costs are transportation, accommodation, and security fees. Your Holiness, on behalf of the University of Arkansas, thank you so very much for your presence here today and your enlightening ideas on issues of such profound importance to us all. We will not soon forget this afternoon. I ask that all remain standing as His Holiness exits the stage. For those seated on the floor, please use the tunnel to your right as you exit from the arena. The tunnel will be open as soon as His Holiness has departed. Thank you all for joining us today, and be safe on your journey home. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just sorry. Hmm? I'm a university hmm? So, uh, those points which I mentioned, anyone who feel some sort of so the interesting, some sense, then please think more and try to implement in our own daily life. Then eventually you find sort of some values. Then those people who feel not much sort of interest, then forget it. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, phone is watching. Come along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wanted to change now. <laughs> she is a... okay. Thank you. That's okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I very much appreciate all your work, oh. all your help. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. 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 The same person. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? So, bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.